Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our virtual lunch and learn event, Digging Into Soil Health on Illinois Dairy Farms. A big thank you to Illinois Stewardship Alliance for choosing our session to be a part of Soil Health Week. I'm Christine Cliff. I'm a Sustainable Nutrition Manager with Midwest Dairy. And for those of you who are not familiar with Midwest Dairy, we service 4,400 dairy farms here in the Midwest region, our 10 state Midwest region. But the, as part of the National Dairy Checkoff, we focus on nutrition education, dairy promotion, research, and health and well being in order to bring dairy to life for a better world. And dairy farmers work very hard every single day in order to take care of their cattle and provide us with nutritious and delicious dairy foods, as well as to take care of the environment and be good stewards of the land, as you're going to hear today. Dairy industry is dedicated to sustainability, and the dairy industry is, represents only 2% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, and our dairy farmers are striving hard to bring that down even further. By the year 2050, they're striving to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero. Just a few housekeeping tips for tonight, or for today, this afternoon. Uh, this session is being recorded. So we are going to be sharing out the link in case you have colleagues that want to watch it after today or you want to just recap of what I was discussed this afternoon. There is going to be a Q&A session of it after our, our discussion. So please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box so we can address them at the end of the session. Now it's my honor to be able to introduce our panel today. This is Jim Eisman. He is a soil health expert with ISAP. And he's going to be moderating the session today. And we have Andy Lenkaitis from Lenkaitis Holsteins from St. Charles, Illinois. And then we have Nate Dinderman from Hunter Haven Farm in Pearl City, Illinois. I'm going to pass the mic on to Jim. He's going to be starting the moderation of the discussion. Enjoy, everybody. All right. Thank you, Christine. And, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, looking forward to kind of getting in the weeds a little bit with a couple of Northern Illinois dairymen. Get to see some of the ins and outs of what's going on on their farm, um, how they treat their, their livestock, how they treat their soils, and really get into uh, that, that idea of soil health and, and building sustainability. So we'll have a moderated discussion. At the end of it, we'll open things up for anybody with questions who's joining us online. Um, we're gonna have a couple of videos that we have pre-recorded to just uh, highlight a little bit on the farm what these farmers are doing, which worked out pretty well since today isn't a very pleasant day. Uh, before we jump into the videos, we're going to let each each farmer give a little bit of an introduction so you can get to know them a little bit better before we jump into the video. So if we can start with, with Andy. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the farm. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, so we, we, we farm. I'm a co-owner of Uncutus Holsteins along with my wife, Sarah. Uh, Sarah's actually on the farm day-to-day uh, -day, taking care of our roughly 85 milk cows and about 180 animals total in the farm. Uh, we are just outside of St. Charles, Illinois, which is a, a pretty good-sized city. And so we farm in between a lot of houses and developments and subdivisions, uh, which is a little bit unique for our location. Uh, but just looking forward to kind of discussing a little bit more about our, our crops and how we do things to manage and, and make feed for our cows in our area. Thank you, Nate. Nathan Ninnerman from Hunter Haven Farms over in Pearl City, Illinois. Um, we milk about a thousand cows, uh, farm about 2,500 acres. Uh, about six years ago, a uh, partner and I, Scott Brenner and his wife and my wife and I, uh, purchased the farm from uh, Doug and Tom Block and, um, and try to keep the reputation going and, you know, being stewards of the land. Uh, we we neighbor a 650-acre private lake on our, on our border, so we have a lot of uh, urban people in our area. We're located right on a main highway, so there's... There's a lot of things that we try to do to uphold the the perception and image of and do the right thing at the in at the right time. All right, thank you. So we're going to get a little more in depth on each of these farms, and we're going to start off by showing some videos that actually get out on their farms, show some of the livestock and the land that they work. I think sustainability and environmental impact is something that's top of mind for a lot of people, no matter what industry you're in or what business you're in. Hi, my name is Sarah Linkaitis, and I'd like to welcome you guys to Linkaitis Holsteins. This is my family's dairy farm where I farm alongside my husband, Andy, and our son, Lucas. When my parents started this farm in 1983, we had just five cows that we started with. What's been important to us is that we make the best use of the resources we have available. 
in our area, land is not easy to come by, so we want to make sure that we can utilize it to the fullest extent while treating it the best that we can. So right now today, we produce about double the milk with about the same amount of land that we used previously. And we do that by taking better care of the cow and by taking better care of the crops that we feed those animals. And part of that is our healthy soil that we use. What we're looking at here today is part of our cover crops or overwinter crops. This is actually Italian ryegrass. So we planted this after corn came off this fall. This gives us an opportunity to do a double crop throughout the year so we can grow twice as much forage on the same amount of ground and make better use of the, the little bit of land that we have available to us here. We actually do a lot of recycling here on the farm. Um, so first I'd start with the cow's feed. So cows eat a lot of things that can't be utilized by, by you or me. So we grow a lot of our own crops that we use for our feed, um, which is formulated by um, our nutritionist. Then we'll start to look at what byproducts can we add to the cow's diet. So we actually have um, two byproducts in our cow's diet right now. One is called corn gluten, which is a byproduct of corn production that couldn't be used otherwise. Um, and the other is whole fuzzy cotton seed, which is a byproduct of cotton production. So things that you or I can't eat or utilize um, can then be recycled and eaten by our cows to then produce milk that you and I can enjoy. The other thing is we do recycle our manure. And what we do with the manure that we collect is we run it through what's called a manure separator. Now that's kind of like that old ringer washer machine that you've maybe seen before. So it, it takes the um, manure and it rolls it between two sets of rollers and it's actually mechanically separating the fiber portion from the liquid portion. Now the liquid portion is important to us because that's where all the nutrients are that we want to use as fertilizer, a natural fertilizer, to help grow our crops. And then the fiber portion doesn't have a lot of nutritional value, um, but what it does make is a great bedding for our cows. The other thing that we do on our farm to recycle is we actually utilize our water a couple of times. Um, so we have a plate cooler in our milk house and we use that plate cooler um, to help us cool down our milk before it's stored in our bulk tank. You know, we're less than 50 miles from downtown Chicago. Some people think we're crazy for wanting the farm, especially livestock farm in this area. What keeps us here is that it's a wonderful place to grow up. And for us, I couldn't think of a better place where I got to grow up and where I get to raise my family. And there's nothing better than taking care of animals and having that relationship, provide them with, with shelter and food. They provide milk that we can consume. It's a great, wonderful relationship. Hi there, I'm Scott Brenner from Hunter Haven Farms. I'm a 20 plus year veteran of dairy industry and today we're seeing our dairy farm and we milk about 900 cows. One of our two manure holding basins, that's where the fluent is held that comes off of the separator uh, before it's applied to the fields for fertilizer for our corn crop. Uh, one of the awesome things that uh, cows do is produce natural fertilizer for us. Um, it's a byproduct, obviously uh, comes off of the digester through the separator, but uh, we house or we hold uh, the liquid affluent in our holding basins until we can apply it to the corn, for the corn crop in the spring and in the fall. So we're standing in one of our alfalfa crops fields that we have here on the farm. This is one of several uh, acres of the 500 that we raise for the forage for our dairy cows. Uh, this is currently the third crop regrowth that's coming here. We'll be harvesting this in a couple weeks. Um, we utilize about 500 acres of alfalfa in our in our crop rotation for several reasons. One, obviously, is it's a it's a great feedstuff for the cows, and it can be utilized in our rations. But also, as you can see by the topography around us, it's very important for maintaining soil health. Um, you can see the rolling hills that we have around us and it's not feasible to have just continuous row crops on these acres and so we can utilize alfalfa in our rotations to help minimize soil erosion along with um, no-till farming and minimum till farming on, on the row crop acres that we do have here at the dairy. So this is uh, 
One of our pastures that we use in the summertime to house a lot of our bred heifers that will be coming into the dairy. And I think it's a great view of the entire uh, aspect of, of our dairy operation. Um, as you can see in the foreground here, our pasture, uh, which has a creek running through it. And we actually farm the ground that has two of the major creeks that feed the water for Lake Carroll, which is one of the largest privately owned lakes here in the state. And so uh, we do a lot of things, or we try to do a lot of things to be for not only friendly for it with our neighbors, but also just to be very conscientious about the environment. We feel like the dairy is a very important part of the ecosystem here. Uh, you can see in our pasture here, this is a kind of a wetland area that is in our pasture that we've that we've fenced off so we can maintain that area. A lot of wildlife live in that area as well, along with all our, our uh, grass border strips that we have here at the dairy. Uh, again, great environment for white-tailed deer, pheasants, so on and so forth. But I think it, it shows a, a very good view and perspective of, of us being able to have a, a fairly modern uh, dairy facility that we're able to milk our cows and still coexist with nature. All right, thank you. A uh, couple of good videos there, nicely nicely done on your farms. Give us some good background to see how everything is done on more of the day-to-day -day operation. Uh, we're here to talk about soil health. Uh, obviously, livestock integration is a, a great way to get started with soil health, but then utilizing cover crops really becomes a, a big part of the conversation. So I think our first step here today, will be talking a little bit about some of the cover crops that you guys use. Saw some of them on the videos, but let's go to a, a little more in depth. Uh, tell us a little bit about the cover crops that you guys are using this year, um, how you decide what cover crops to use from year to year, um, and most importantly, how did you get started? And then the value that they could bring, because obviously for you guys, they're not just cover crops, they can be livestock feed, which, which is entirely different than your typical grain farmer. So I know walk us through those basics of cover crops on your farm. Let's start with Andy. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we run about 250 acres total, uh, but only about 100 of that is actually available for row crops. Uh, we have some other hay ground that's owned by maybe the Forest Preserve or other conservation entities that we can have some limited options what we can do. Um, so we looked at it as we wanted to grow our dairy. Um, 2017, we built a new barn. We wanted to milk a few more cows, put in some technology. And so we had a challenge of how do we grow more feed with what's available for us for land. And so a big part of that was looking at our corn silage crop. We took it off and August, September usually, and really didn't get back on that ground until coming back in you know April or May, depending on how the season was for planting corn. And cover crops were getting a lot more um, attention and different ad groups and everything, and it, it looked like a good option for us. So um, I definitely didn't know what I was doing when I got started, uh, but that's okay. We kind of tried a few acres here and there, maybe five or 10, just to get started with what, the, with what equipment we had, did some research. Um, really for us, I, I've tried some Italian ryegrass, I've tried some sorghum Sudan mixes and cocktail mixes. And, and for us, what kind of got filtered out was really a rye or a triticale. And the big reason for the rye and trit was really just timing of getting it on in the fall, uh, but also in the spring, having that option to get, um, I like to do about half rye and half triticale just because the rye usually um, matures up a little sooner, a little earlier, so I can do have one window to harvest that, and then a second window to come in and, and harvest the trit. And that gives me a little more flexibility in the spring because it really just is, is me to do the crop work on our acreage. Um, but getting started was just to uh, just go after and try it, do some research and prove it on your own acreage. You know, we did some different things where uh, we harvested the crop, uh, looked at the nutrient value, and then tried some different things next year with putting some different nutrients on it, different timing to see how that changed our protein levels and our feed value of that crop. Uh, but overall, it's been, been a successful program for us and it's really nice, especially this time of year, uh, having those fields pop back up green and seeing that crop already growing. So yeah, we have a couple of pictures of some of the cover crops that you've raised on your farm. You know, you mentioned that sorghum sedan. Kind of sound, sounds like you started off with that a little bit earlier. Are you still using sorghum sedan in your operation? I, st I still use it. Uh, traditionally, that's a, a warm weather crop. So we kind of use that maybe between uh, triticale coming off in the spring. And if I'm going to put off alpha in that field in the fall, gives me that kind of two-month window to get that uh, warm season crop in there. So we still do a couple acres of it. Um, it's it's nice because it's a higher sugar crop for the cow, so it can work into our ration a little bit differently. 
And it's nice because I can use it in different spots. I don't need to grow a huge acreage of it to work it into the ration, either the cows or for our younger heifers. Uh, but it's been a nice crop and it's kind of cool to see. It looks a little like corn, gets nice and tall, uh, but you treat it a little differently than you would corn silage. I guess last thing before we jump over to Nathan, a little bit about the quality side of things. So you're chopping some of these forages in the springtime, right? Your triticale and rye, that's mm -hmm. probably your biggest one. Have you have you learned anything over the years on how to capture the better quality for your dairy farms in terms of the timing? A, a big thing is, and I, I'm a I'm an engineer by training. I'm not an agronomist, not a crop scout by any means. Um, but I we kind of had to learn that side of it. Go out there, look at the fields, look at the plant itself. Um, understand kind of what my optimal optimal harvest windows are for both yield and forage quality. And we know we kind of get some different windows and then try to time that between uh, my work schedule and then also with weather to get that crop cut dried down to a suitable level so we can properly ensile it and make good good forage out of it. Um, that's That's been the biggest challenge. And then from the, I'd say from the equipment side, just knowing what equipment to use to minimize any any dirt or anything else that would get into that crop to make the best quality feed and just kind of paying a little closer attention to soil so I'm not putting ruts in the field, not doing any damage for my the next crop coming for the that summer season. I know I just have some beef cattle experience, but knowing that for you for the dairymen, the quality is such a big big deal for you guys to keep your cows in, in good health and, and working well. So all right, I'll turn it over to, to you, Nathan. Then how did you guys um, get started with the cover crops and uh what do you what do you kind of fallen into over the years well uh we we've actually been doing some some cover crops for probably over 20 some years uh i started at hunter haven in, in 2003 and uh the previous owners had always put a, a rye cover crop out onto their chopped acres and we well we, we've tried to maintain and, and to expand that um currently like last year we ended up planting a little over 1200 acres of cover crops uh Every every acre of corn ground that got chopped got a, a rye cover crop into it, and uh, and then every acre of bean double too that we also put cover crops in. Um, we we don't do a lot of diversification. We've mainly been using the rye. Um, we have dabbled in the last two years of planting a hybrid rye that's new to the market. Uh, supposed to be a little bit higher quality, a little bit uh faster growing uh better better feed for the cattle uh we chopped some of that last year i got about 150 acres of that planted for this year too but uh um like i said always always kind of been doing some with the cover crops uh we have done a few mixes um not a whole lot we do try to get some radishes out in with the rye mix is if the timing allows for it to get adequate growth in the winter before the winter time um we do a lot you know do a lot of diversification with with the crops between wheat and and alfalfa and corn and uh very little soybeans close to the dairy where the ground rolling and stuff but we're trying to what we're trying to get to is uh a green living crop on every almost every acre every of all the time and uh right now i don't have it on corn on for combine corn but uh anything that we chopped or combine for beans is is got a cover crop on to maintain some cover and uh then like i said we are starting to utilize more of it as a cattle feed source for us in this in the springtime uh chopping some rye and uh like you said earlier the timing quality is very critical to have a, a dairy quality feed but uh it, it can be done and it can make a very good double crop you know and be way to utilize your acres a little better and provide that cover that's out there yeah, it seems like there's been really good adoption of uh cover crops or after that silage cut on corn right you got that great opportunity in what years ago would have been bare ground now it was almost always at least in my experience when i go by the fields uh, getting cover crop that oftentimes used for for a forage. So we saw some of your pictures up there as well with the cereal rye. Uh, seems to give you guys pretty good tonnage. Uh, can really, I mean, do you, do you think that's been a pretty good impact on the bottom line in terms of getting the getting that forage out of it? Sounds like you're maybe just more starting with the forage side of things, but we, yeah, we haven't been doing. We haven't chopped a lot of rye, but uh, you know, last year we we chopped still about 120 acres of rye and it ended up being about about six tons of dry matter 
to the acre of, of feed at the end and and it was a uh, good quality dairy quality we fed it better right to the milk cows cows really did well on it you know and then we turned around and and basically no-till corn back into it and we had a little bit of a drier year last year and uh stuff but we still got 24 25 ton corn silage off of that same acres you know so if you can combine a, a reasonable corn silage yield and uh, a, you know a decent yield of a of a cereal grain forage on that each on every acre you know it, it does help to the bottom line where you're you're keeping that ground covered and you're, you're planting the cover crop anyway so it's like well let's harvest it and get some value out of it as as we're doing the process everybody is kind of uh, looking to to cover crops to, to solve a lot of problems these days we got carbon markets we got soil health uh so you know a lot of people have a lot of experience a lot of people also are also just starting off so real quick what what would be a piece of advice you would give to somebody just starting off with cover crops you know maybe it's somebody doing livestock or maybe it's just a corn or soybean farmer trying them out for the first time but uh what what piece of advice would you give um, the piece of advice I would give is it, it's not going to work perfect every time, but it doesn't mean give up on it. Um, you know, we tried a little bit of a different sorghum sudan that was maybe a multi-cut variety. And it just, when I looked at the yields at the end of the year, it wasn't the same as what I could get off of a, a nice alfalfa grass mix or other things. But I only had 10 acres of it and it was in a couple different small fields. So it wasn't a big loss overall. Uh, but I learned kind of what to look for. And that was a big thing is just Try it on your own acres. You don't have to do everything all at once. I'm not able to get all of my ground covered, uh, but if I can get a majority of it, I know it's going to be successful. And then every year, try something, maybe a touch different, just to see how it plays out and keep track of why or why it did or why it didn't work that year. So you kind of know how to hedge your bet for future years. And, and to follow up to what Andy was saying there is the same thing doing it two times in a row might work great the one year next year it might fail miserably oh. but just because it failed doesn't mean you are necessarily wrong i mean sometimes mother nature doesn't cooperate with the timely rains um you know sometimes falls get delayed you don't get the cover crop seed planted quite as early as you'd like to you know but the biggest thing is is there's there's a lot of people that are doing this all across the country and they're doing it well with success there's there's resources there's people out there to find pretty easily now especially mo way more than even five years ago on the cover crops the you know the, the the soil health benefits that are out there and uh there there's there's a lot of resources out there now and that wasn't there before. And like I said, you just gotta try it. You get, you get get into it, dabble into it here and there, get creative and turn it turn it into just a learning experience and and just like a little experiment that you get to do to have some fun and try something different. Interesting how many farmers adopting cover crops talk about it as uh, the, the guys are really into it as almost being fun, right? It, yep. it, it makes it just more interesting. They like the challenges. They like to get into that. Uh, but we use those cover crops oftentimes to kind of fill in between corn, soybeans, or whatever our rotation are. You livestock producers tend to just be naturally more diverse to begin with. So talk a little bit about your general crop rotation. Um, I think we mentioned wheat. Obviously, alfalfa plays a role, but kind of kind of connect the dots between that crop rotation and um, utilizing those other crops besides just cover crops or small grains in your you know permanent forages. Yeah, so I, I try to rotate my alfalfa fields every every three to five years, depending on stand quality when I'm getting out there for yields. And that's kind of my my benchmark. You know, that field's going to stay alfalfa because I put the investment in there to get the, the haylage off of there and to really make sure I'm getting the best out of that crop. And then I look where I can utilize corn in between there. Obviously, corn silage is, makes up a majority of our diet, so it's still um, just over half. So I want to make sure I have adequate corn silage and look at yields and everything there. And then as far as putting cover crop on and what that next spring forage will be, it varies a little bit on what I know about the field, how wet it's gonna potentially be in the spring, um, distance away to haul manure to it and haul uh, the forage back in the spring. Uh, but what I really enjoy doing, if I can do everything perfect, my ideal world would be corn with a rye or trit each winter, uh, do that for maybe three or four years on one field. And then I can turn that over to alfalfa 
for three or four years and then come back to corn. And then depending on what I have for yields and crop available or land available, uh, if I can bring in a soybean crop for a year in between there, not that I'm going to really feed that on the dairy uh, directly, but just to help break up um, my crop rotation and take care of rootworms and some other things um, that we're kind of learning about still as, as far as our specific crop rotation. And then some of the smaller fields, that's where I like to experiment a little bit, maybe pull something out of hay production and put in Italian ryegrass or sorghum sedan, just kind of what makes sense uh, with the year. Um, I try to put a plan together and I, I wish I could say it worked the same every year, but it doesn't. And so just being flexible and kind of having that knowledge of if I need to get seed pretty quick of something that's not readily available, knowing where I can go to get those sources. And so I can kind of shift on the fly as weather changes and timing gets a little more questionable to put different crops in to make it work. Pretty similar to you know what Andy said there. We do uh, we do a lot of corn. Uh, well, pretty typical for us is that we'll have a field of corn in uh, in production for about three to five years, and when it's in corn and uh, close to the dairy, uh, each year that field will get uh, liquid manure either spring or fall, and uh, it'll stay corn for about four or five years, and then. After that, then we'll rotate it back out and we'll put it back into alfalfa. Um, the nice thing about that is if you, you know, you you can build the nutrients up pretty good in, in the soil after a couple of years of, of the manure and stuff. So once we get the, the levels built back up and uh, then that's when we put it into an alfalfa crop. And so, cause alfalfa takes a lot of P and K out of the soil and uh, so we'll run it in alfalfa, usually four to five years on a year on an alfalfa stand. Um, we do uh, do put about 100, 150 acres of wheat a year out. Uh, just kind of the same thing. We can utilize the straw on the farm. Uh, breaks up crop rotation, gives you some diversity. And what we started doing in the last two years is uh, we'll take the, we'll harvest the wheat and bale the straw. And then we'll come back in and we'll uh, knife liquid manure into it. And then we'll actually seed that down to either a, a cover crop mix that's just for a cover or like the last two years, we've actually went in and, and planted our hybrid rye in about the middle of August so that by the end of the fall, we could have a rye cover crop out there that's about a foot, foot and a half tall. And then, uh, then over winter and then the next spring we'll come back in and uh, chop that off as, as a forage and stuff. But uh, same thing, we, we we got a lot of rolling hills. Um, we do plant some soybeans, but those are mainly on farms that are not close to the dairy that that are a lot uh, leveler, not the rolling hills that we have. And, uh, but we try to keep a good rotation, try to break up the farms as best we can, you know, contour strips and some spots. Uh, try not to put the whole hillside into one crop at a time just to, for erosion and, and crop rotation and stuff like that. Well, let's go from there into kind of the question about uh, manure management. You mentioned some of that yep. in there, but um, talk through a little bit how you manage the manure on your farm. This is often something that can be seen as as a problem when we see livestock farms. You kind of already highlighted some of the positive yep. of it. It can be a fertilizer uh, when used properly. So kind of highlight and start with you, Nate. On so, like with with our manure system, uh, kind of like what you saw in the video for Andy's farm there too. We are we are separating the solids out of our manure with a mechanical separator. The the dry product is used as bedding in our free stalls. And then the liquid is held, and then we usually haul that two or three times a year, spring and fall, and then after a wheat harvest in late summer. And uh, what we do is, you know, all that liquid manure is custom applied at an agronomic rate at what the growing crop that we're planning on following with is going to be needing. When we when we put a, our liquid manure on. Um, on a corn on corn crop, we don't put any additional fertilizer of any sort out there. Um, so that's a big part of it. So it, it is our it is our main part of our fertilizer for our growing crop of the next year. And uh, 
the size that we are, we, we are a larger farm and stuff. So we do have a lot of rules and regulations that we have to follow. Um, we do not apply any manure during the winter months when the ground is frozen. Um, any manure that we apply is either injected into the ground or if we do surface apply anything, we do come back within 24 hours and incorporate that manure into the ground to, to avoid the possibility of, you know, a major rain or a snowstorm or something like that happening and nutrients getting moved to where they're not supposed to be. Yeah, our farm, uh, somewhat similar. We utilize liquid manure the best that we can. Um, our, our manure system, our, our application system is, uh, I think our tanker was built in 1998, so it's kind of getting towards the end of its life. I don't have a great way to inject manure, um, so I do more surface application. Uh, but what I try to do is put the manure on in the morning, spread my couple, lo you know, spread maybe about a, uh, one load per acre, which is about 6,000 gallons with our tanker. So I'm usually getting about 60 pounds of nitrogen on, on the crop. Uh, which works out pretty well for usually the following crop, whether it's a cover crop or getting some nutrients built up for corn. Um, but I try to put manure on a couple hours in the morning and then come back right away that afternoon to work it down. Uh, the, it's one of the challenges where we are just given our location, more urban area. I try to do it uh, when it's a little cooler out uh, just to kind of help keep good relations with the neighbors. Um, even though they moved out to a more farming area, they don't always appreciate the uh, odor that comes with manure by any means. <laughs> Um, and then it gives me a chance to to kind of split up my day a little bit, so I'm not just hauling everything, blocking traffic, maybe on a few roads here and there, getting cars behind me. Um, but that's worked out really well. Um, a lot of our fields are that kind of 10 to 15 acres, so I can get 10, 15 loads out in a few hours. Go work that, go work that ground in the afternoon without spreading a lot of mud on the road as I'm transporting things back and forth. And that's matched up pretty well to our uh, crop nutrient needs. Um, again, I'm doing mainly in, in May when we're pulling the rye and triticale off in the spring and then again in the fall once the corn silage comes off. Um, we do plant a little bit of wheat as well, and that gives me a chance in the summer to get some manure on the ground before we plant an alfalfa or something else after that. Um, I try not to spread if it's going to be over like 80 degrees that day, again, just for the neighbor side of things. Um, but that's, that's worked out pretty well. Um, we don't have a lot of no-till equipment, so I do work the ground. Uh, just with a soil finisher just to break that top couple inches up to help incorporate that manure uh, you keep those nutrients in the field and then reduce my emissions uh, both from smell and everything else on that ground and that usually prepares the seed bed pretty nice and if i'm coming in with just a pretty standard drill afterwards to uh, apply a cover crop i think when people hear that, that you, you put that rate out there that six thousand gallons to the acre um, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, what is making up most of that? Sounds like an awful lot, but what is most of that? Yeah, most of our manure is in that four to six percent solid, so it's it's still ninety plus percent water, and so it's a pretty light um, nutrient as far as nutrients go. Um, I just talk in gallons because I know how big my manure pit is on my tanker. I don't have uh, auto steer or GPS or anything too fancy in my equipment, so I know this field's twenty acres. I need to get twenty loads out there today. And that kind of works out well in my math, and I can kind of space things out pretty easily then. Um, that way, it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward, and I can kind of just make notes in my notebook. And I have a couple standard manure tests. I try to test a couple times as I'm stirring that pit up and pulling things out. It's, it's pretty cheap and efficient to do a test and send that sample in. And then I kind of know where my, my nutrients should be and kind of match then if I have to add anything additional to that afterwards. Great. I think we're going to try to get to through maybe about two more questions before we open it up for, for audience questions. But uh, walk us through the forage side of things a little bit more. Um, talk about, I mean, first of all, we're talking a lot about silage and uh, how do you handle that as silage? Do you handle hay? Do you do any uh, much grazing or how do you uh, handle that side of things to get the forage to the cow, however that works? Uh, we, we do a little bit of dry hay um, and some pasture ground. If I'm able to get manure on after a first or a third cutting of, of hay, that seems to work out pretty well just to help give that crop a boost before the next uh, cutting. And then pasture, I kind of let, let the cows do my own manure application on there. We just keep track of what we're put, feeding them uh, on as, as our dry corn and mineral mix, but then they kind of do the rest of the work as far as uh, grabbing the grass and everything and spreading the nutrients out. Um, we do some soil testing too, and that helps kind of determine where I need to put nutrients maybe that following year or focus a little more. Uh, but it's it's nice to have the different buckets of opportunity to kind of put manure on here, here and there, different times throughout the year, and then be able to utilize different crops based on the weather. If I'm going to make haylage, or I'm going to try to make baleage, or make it for dry hay, so I have something maybe I can sell off the farm too. 
Yeah, uh, very similar. We, uh, we we do chop most of our uh, crops just because of uh, the amount of animals and stuff that we're going to be feeding. Um, on a typical year, we're going to be looking at chopping around seven to 750 acres of corn silage. Um, and then on a normal year, we're running about, about 500 to about 525 acres of alfalfa. Uh, we'll chop that four times a year, and that'll all get in, in siled into bunker silos. Um, we do chop about 150 to 200 acres of rye each year as well. And then we, we do a lot of baling of some small grass patches, waterways, uh, a little bit of dry hay here and there and stuff. But those are the main parts of our forage program. Well, I think we want to talk somewhat then about uh, the impacts that you're seeing on your farm from these practices. Both of you have been doing this a number of years. You've brought a lot of these practices onto the farm. Um, so I one thing we you mentioned a little bit about soil testing. So maybe you can kind of integrate that idea of soil testing because I'm kind of curious if you've done any other um, soil testing in terms of soil health assessments or soil, uh, soil tests of that nature, but talk a little bit about the change you've seen on the farm from these practices over the last 20 years, 10 years, however long you guys have been doing things. I'd, I'd say for me, the biggest change I've seen is, you know, we, we don't have a planter, so I don't plant my own corn. So I'm generally waiting on our crop farming neighbors who, you know, help me out and come over the corn planter. And so a lot of my corn's getting in a little later. And before, whether it was bare ground over the winter, we'd see the weeds start to develop on that, that corn ground and have to do some more uh, control on those weeds to get rid of them. Now, with the cover crops, it gives me a chance to kind of keep that ground covered. I don't get the weed pressure in the springtime. And then even after, when I cut that crop and harvest it, I leave, try to leave four or five inches, leave it a little higher than maybe I normally would. But that seems to help uh, later on when that corn crop's coming up, give it a little more protection from weed pressure and even a little bit from pulling too much moisture from the soil in those little hotter temperatures. Um, as far as nutrient uh, soil testing, we we started doing it every four years. I think I might go to a little more frequency as I'm putting a little more manure on and kind of understanding things a little better. Uh, but it's it's been nice to see, especially as, as Nate mentioned on those corn ground, um, see those nutrients build up a little bit in my phosphorus, potassium, and then move that over to hay and not not have the same need to add that those nutrients back in during my uh, my cuttings of haylage for sure. Uh, you know, to me, there's been a lot of benefits of the cover crops. Uh, you know, we, we do soil sampling every three years, and uh, you're you're seeing a, a rise in the organic matter in the soil. Uh, you're seeing uh, just the soil is healthier. Um, like I said, we're we're utilizing the manure, we're utilizing the the diversification and crop rotation and stuff, and we're making the the, the soil bring them back to life and. Uh, Probably one of the biggest benefits is is the erosion control. You know, like I said, we are on rolling ground, and uh, probably the two biggest things is I like to see green out there. I mean, uh, the last couple of weeks now that's been warmed up and stuff. I look around and all of our fields are green. You know, and it I like I like to see that, and you know, and then the other thing is you know I get home at night I can. I can sleep at night too because I know I might not be doing everything exactly perfect, but at least you're trying, you know. And and I think there's there's a lot of opportunities out there to do things just a little bit better than what we we have been doing, you know. And and I think a lot of people maybe get scared away with cover crops and think that it's going to be a disaster or it's going to hurt their yields. Um, I, I think they're wrong, and I think there's a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of resources to, and a lot of people that are doing it well, and and uh, I think it's only going to be uh, better for the industry and better for the image of everything coming down the road. And to me, there's some really exciting things coming on 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 the sustainability side of of agriculture and cover crops. Yeah, definitely a lot come down even, you know, you mentioned using like hybrid rye and uh, even the sorghum sedans, you know, the, even when we start to apply some of the development that we apply to our corn and soybeans, when we can put it on something like that, we can make a lot of big changes. I think you said you've seen yep. good yield improvements by switching to something like hybrid rye. So lots of potential there. We, talked, uh, we didn't talk too much on the tillage side of things. It sounds like obviously we're still incorporating some tillage with what you guys are doing, but the soils stays green most of the year, right? You're, you're doing those tillage passes 
then we get something else out there, right? It's not like it's laying bare. So we talk through the, the tenants of a, of a healthy soil. Sometimes you throw that tillage out there and you think, oh my goodness, what's going on? But um, you're, you're usually right back there planting something else out there, right? And uh, like you say, with the maneuver side of things, you have some other uh, issues they have to contend with, whether it be odor or, or potential runoff. So um, talk a little bit. The last question would maybe be, as we might have just a couple minutes left, uh, reducing some of those inputs. I think you guys have really kind of covered the idea of, of reducing. Obviously, your, your fertilizer is pretty, pretty heavily because you're recycling those nutrients. Uh, you talked a little bit about reducing on your on your weed control, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're seeing that. Is there, is there any other things you can quantify in terms of, of reducing some of those uh, inputs, whether it's um, you know herbicides and then or also any other kind of pesticides or uh, anything on your on your livestock even um, that you guys have seen from these benefits or pretty well hold the line on the where have you where have you gone with those? Um, I, I'd say like on the livestock side. You know, we were always uh, just straight haylage and corn silage and being able to implement a third forage into that really helps us because we have a lot of smaller fields where we're using a chopper with wagons and we're putting in bags so we don't have the same mixing of those forages in that bag we're kind of feeding out as we're putting it in so having that third forage really helps our animals room and stay a lot healthier because when i do have to make a change from one field to another or one bag to another i'm only changing one one part of their diet which is not as big of a part because i have three forages instead of two and so that we've seen a lot more consistency as far as room and health, which relates to animal health and comfort and production as well. Well, I mean, part of that too, you know, we're trying to, you know, reduce the amount of, you know, tillage that we do. Um, we, we, we do have to incorporate our manure and stuff. So there is, there is action that we have to do with that. And then a lot of times we do have to come back in and do just a little bit of action to, you know, to level the fields back up. But we we are probably about ninety five percent no till or slash vertical till. Um, virtually haven't touched a chisel plow or a plow in in decades. Um, uh, like I said, try to do as much no till as we can. Last year I did incorporate uh, a strip till unit into it, so I'm doing a, a, a like a vertical till strip till pass. And what we're trying to do with that is. Uh, to go into those heavier right cover crops and uh, basically make it create create just a small seed bed and uh, we're just a little bit of tillage action down to about an inch and a half two inches deep about six inches wide where then we'll come back in a day or two later and uh, plant into that strip um, as of reducing inputs um, we haven't gotten to the point where we're we obviously reduced inputs because of the manure and stuff, but that's kind of the way it's always been. But we haven't necessarily reduced anything on the chemical side, but uh, I'm really hoping to get to that point. Uh, really hoping within the next year or two to actually incorporate a, a cover crop roller crimper onto my strip till bar so that I could actually leave those cover crops alive and standing and go in there and, and lay that residue and cover down and uh i'm hoping at that point in time then we can start uh cutting back and or reducing the uh, the number of chemical passes needed for weed control because you're going to be laying laying a heavy thick mat down between the rows and using that as weed control and so another big thing is too is uh it, it's it's an input but you don't think about it that much but equipment and fuel is is a lot less if you're literally only going into that field and planting it instead of going in there chiseling it field cultivating it twice running an anhydrous bar across it you know and then going in and planting it so fuel and, and machinery is a big input savings things on on things as well for the no-till or reduced tillage side of things all right well i think that was a pretty good summary of everything you guys are doing on your farms and uh, like you say there's still plenty of things to to do to do it'd be interesting to hear how your uh world of crimping goes with the strip tillage but i think we're gonna take a minute here now and, and answer some questions from the audience i think uh christine are you gonna read those off to us so the one came through is that have you ever used any balanza clover in a mix of triticale or rye to help diversify in a typical grass on grass type rotation no, I haven't specifically used any clovers uh, yet, and that's maybe something I'll look to in the future uh, just to help add some nitrogen 
uh, fixation capacities and kind of increase the protein of it. I, I have not used any of that clover. I have tried uh, a cover crop mix that had some red clover in. Um, it tried interseeding that into standing corn crop. Um, didn't work because it didn't rain <laughs> stuff that year. But um, there's, it's interesting the cover crop mixes and stuff that our guys are coming up with because I think they really do work well. Um, I just haven't gotten to that point yet. I'm still I'm still trying to figure out the basics, and I'm trying to get the most cover out there to protect the soil as fast as I can and stuff. So I haven't looked into the legume cover crop species mix very much yet. Uh, so both of you mentioned um, solid separation. Are either of you composting? Uh, we do not compost right now um, because most of what we produce for solids we're using on the farm is bedding, uh, so we don't really have that storage. Um, and then if we do have some extra, I'm traditionally putting that on some fields that are could use that organic matter a little bit better, or we actually have a couple of local landscapers that purchase it, or we actually let the neighbors community come by and pick up whatever they want for their, their gardens or whatever they're doing with it. And sometimes they give some fruit and vegetables back, which has been pretty cool as well. So. Manure is stored in an anaerobic condition. Does applying anaerobic manure have a detrimental effect on crop fields? Have you applied any manure to live crops? We, uh, no, we do not apply any manure to live crops. Um, like I said, we 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 have to incorporate everything within 24 hours of application. So that's therefore we don't put anything on the live crops. Um, as part of the manure, though, I we have had no detriments. Uh, from applying that type of manure onto onto our ground and and in an agronomical sensible rate, you know, to grow our to grow our crops. No, yeah. The only detriment I see is when you don't apply manure to it. You can kind of see where your line was and and where it is. We we do. I will try to apply some to alfalfa crops uh, just to help make it so I don't have to purchase any potassium and utilize that crop. Uh, but there is. Um, so it is a growing crop, but I'm not doing, it's not really an active vegetation until it puts those leaves back on it. So it's nice time to get in there right after cutting and put that manure on there. How can an urban farmer reduce carbon footprint and improve their soil? Adding copper to the soil, can adding copper to the soil improve crop yields? I I would not recommend adding copper to the soil. I mean, that's pretty much a hard battle and, you know, there's very, I've never heard of anybody applying copper to, to improve anything on the crop yield or nutritional side of fertilizing. This question is a little, you know, kind of going to the urban side of things, yep. which I know you guys are pretty close uh, to the urban, but maybe a little different. Generally, we're not seeing too many issues where there's copper uh, uh, deficiencies in fields that we would be out trying to put anything for fertilizer out there, to your point. Um, when it, it is needed, but as very small dosage, you know, it might be in your livestock minerals or something at a, at a very low level, but generally not something that is seen as limiting for uh, any soils in Illinois that I'm aware of. Independent dairy producers have had a heck of a time for the last couple of decades. Is there an independent, independent future for them, or will they have to go to massive co ops and conglomerates to continue to be successful? Yeah, that's a that's a big question, and uh, I think that the opportunities that we're looking at now are ways to make our operations more efficient, and that's really where we get the benefit of being able to be in a, a good agronomy state. You know, we're not a, a huge dairy state by any means. I think Illinois is maybe twenty third, uh, but we, we're good at growing crops. So if we can be better at growing crops to make our operations a little more efficient, we're using our land a little better. We're using that manure to the best of our ability. That helps make the overall operation a bit more profitable and keep those farms of our size in the market and competitive. Last one. I believe there are some dairy farms working to make a difference. What can be done to increase how many are, and how can that product, the dairy foods, be accessible to the retail or general public? A little bit different question. Not spoke about soil health, but enough. Well, I mean, part of that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of farmers that are, are trying to do a lot of things that are a little bit different now. You know, uh, the biggest thing is I think people realize is that every farmer is trying to do as best they can, you know, sustainability wise, 
soil health, public image, you know, things like that. I mean, yeah, some some do a little more than others and stuff like that. But I I do think there's a future for for all sizes of farms. Um, and actually, I I think the cover crop, the double cropping, livestock stuff can really benefit, especially on a smaller scale. You know, if if you can go in and and plant a corn crop and interseed a cover crop mix into that, you know, combine the corn off of that field and then turn your beef cattle into that field as to graze all winter. There, there's there's a lot of things that I think the smaller people, smaller farms can and implement and uh, really make a difference. And I think there's there's gonna be, you know, there's there's opportunity for big and small out there, I really do believe. I'd say just, uh, you know, a lot of dairy farms have been around a long time. People, you know, have always consumed milk and different dairy products. Uh, just because we've been around a long time doesn't mean we're not innovating and continuing better ways to make our product more nutritious and uh, more environmentally friendly, more sustainable. So that way the, you can feel good about consuming dairy products, regardless of where they're coming from. That's one that came in. Do you use low disturbance to apply liquid manure? Yes, when you guys are, uh, it doesn't sound like you're yeah. doing much injecting, so maybe not a question for you, yeah. but uh, when you look at your injector, uh, what kind of a manure applicator are you using? Yes, uh, there's, there's two different types of applicators that we're using. We do we do run some tankers um, for small fields and hard to get spots and stuff like that. And they have, they have a knife system on that where it's basically knife and making a slice into the ground, incorporating the manure into the ground and stuff, then uh, the majority of our manure actually gets, it's pumped out through hoses in a drag line system. And uh, that's all getting applied using basically a, a coulter till type system where it's just slicing the ground, um, just enough to so that the, the manure goes into the ground and stays in there. Um, it, it's, it's about the least amount of disturbance that we can do to incorporate and, and, and to hold the manure where, where it needs to be. Other questions that's come through? Did you have any other questions you want to follow up with? I think we've, we've covered a lot of it, just and even the, the injection side of things, the, the changes that have occurred to that over the last 10 to 20 years, you know, those low disturbance injectors. There's been, been a lot of changes in, in how this whole system has, has been done. So I uh, really appreciate you guys joining us today to kind of highlight those. Um, if we don't have any final questions, I thank everyone for joining us and, and hope you enjoy the rest of Soil Health Week. I know there's probably a few other items coming up for the rest of today, but I really appreciate you joining us and uh, hope you all have a, a good day and a good weekend.